Well, good afternoon, everyone. With the smart people. <laughs> I would say that the fact you are all still in the room means that you have very good cognitive health because you've hung in there all day with an immense amount of content delivered to you. So our compliments to you all. Uh, I'm John Kamak. Um, I, for most of my career, worked about an hour from here in Baltimore at T. Rowe Price. And I retired to begin to invest in the very subject matter we've talked about today, this um, fascinating and emerging market in digital brain health. Um, and I've never looked back. Uh, so to set the context before I introduce our panel, which I have the honor of moderating, um, when you're an investor and you begin to look at this space, our role is to bring capital and other resources to support companies that we think are capable of ultimately scaling their interventions to deliver a service or product to a large number of people. Um, and in the area of brain health, in this emerging model of digital health and wearables, uh, it's really our judgment of where you have to look ahead and kind of see the future and say, what will f how will physicians respond? How will care systems respond? How will the consumer respond? And then we have to make informed decisions of what companies have good management, good science, a defendable claim, and the ability to move and have people accept and use that product. For some of us, we do this because we're more um, what's called social impact investors. The, the mission of improving healthcare or some aspect of society is weighed with the return we get on our investment. For other people, it's just it's a professional discipline because people have entrusted money to them and they have to perform uh, and they have to be able to secure returns. So it's a little bit about picking winners. Uh, relevant to everything you've learned today is that as, as a discipline, we have to have a perspective of what's going to work and not work. And with all the talk about uh, neuroplasticity and um, uh, brain plasticity and digital healthcare platforms, we have to come to informed views of what we think are the right pathways, and that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, to do quick introductions, um, Eric Enko is, uh, works for PureTech, uh, which is a firm that has invested in life sciences as well as digital health. Um, you met Adam Gazelli this morning when he did one of the keynotes. Well, behind every great scientist, there is an investor, and that would be Eric in Adam's case, who very early on saw the promise of Achille. And we can come back and ask him what he saw a few years ago that made him willing to take risk with uh, his customer's capital at a very early stage in that company. Charlie Hartwell works for the Bridge Builders Collaborative as their managing uh, partner. It's a fascinating group of four individuals that pool their capital to do positive social change, and especially in uh, mindfulness, improving the capacity of people to reduce their stress and be more connected to themselves in the world. So it's a, a very interesting investment model, and Charlie has a very deep understanding of the various ways that people can deliver a meditation or mindfulness to different uh, parts of the marketplace of the world. Uh, Dan um, is a neuroscientist, PhD, as is, by the way, Eric, who works for uh, an affiliate of Autism Speaks. How many of you have heard of Autism Speaks? Tremendous organization, both in their research platform and their advocacy and and support platform for families. But they also are studying the science, uh, research, and companies that are beginning to deliver new interventions that improve outcomes for those suffering from autism. That's what Dan does. He, uh, he runs that part of their organization. It's a wonderful role you have. And as you said, it's a little bit of a venture philanthropic model, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, Zach is here because um, his, he is, if there's a, an ecosystem of digital brain health and gaming and neural gaming, and there are a thousand people in it, there's one person sitting in the middle, that's Zach. Um, and he, 
he really is very informed on the space, but he also is informed to the point now where he's going to uh, move from being a convener of the intellectual capabilities of the space to become an investor in some of the organizations and people in that space. And then Gary is uh, from the Midwest and in private equity, but doing so after a 35-year career in healthcare that included both hospital management and behavioral health. Um, and in talking to Gary where we did our prep call, it's, well, I love all these things, but they have to make my patients healthier. And it has to be done so with lower cost. And that's the, the pragmatic side of all these new companies and ideas is that ultimately they have to pay for themselves and they have to have better outcomes, not in a clinical setting, but in the marketplace. So, um, and, and kind of as a group, we were all drawn into this area, which in a way, when you look at uh, mental health delivery, it's kind of inefficient when you think of it as a system. A lot of people aren't treated or treated well. Then we look at the size of the problems. You've got at least two billion people that suffer from some mental uh, form of mental illness over their life. That's a couple of trillion dollars of lost productivity. So it's like this, this massive part of the economy. And then you have these little companies that uh, are trying to address it through this new kind of digital wearable gaming set of interventions. So my question, Eric, we'll start with you is, what drew you to this space? What was your investment thesis or why you began to take an interest in this? Sure, so, uh, and PureText model is we actually start companies uh, by translating academic technology. So we'll start a new company, uh, financially seed it, act as the initial management team to drive it forward, and then uh, the company will mature and we'll have money to put on for uh, follow-on financing uh, and uh, have the company uh, move forward. Uh, now, what really attracted us is the huge unmet need that exists in this space. I think you would be very hard-pressed to find a uh, psychiatrist or a neurologist who said, you know what, we're good, we're all stocked up, you know, we don't need any more. Um, and on top of that, if you look at traditional pharmacological approaches, in a number of instances, they've certainly helped um, and they've been beneficial, but clearly they haven't been enough. And if there's a way to use digital approaches or non-pharmacological approaches, which um, a priority you would think are probably gonna be fairly safe, and then on top of that, um, the science suggests that there's potential to have efficacy. That's very powerful. So I think that combination really uh, drew us uh, into the neurotechnology space, uh, starting with Achille. Um, and then we also have another company called Tall Medical, which um, is developing a non-invasive uh, neuromodulation device for the treatment of depression. Uh, in that case, what uh, really excited us was the fact that there was data indicating an immediate effect on depression, uh, which is an unmet need. Um, so it's really a combination of the emerging science uh, plus the unmet need um, and the uh, safety profile of some of these approaches um, that really hold promise. Mm -hmm. Charlie, for you, what, what was the catalyst for beginning to invest in the mindfulness space? And do you see that as a component of the mental health? Well, at Bridge Builders, we call it mind training. And uh, we see uh, similarities to how the physical fitness industry developed 25 years ago. Great science goes to a place where entrepreneurs take that science, build models, uh, businesses, and then people take that to scale. And we, my partners, saw some of the same things happening in what you know, what you could call mind fitness, we call it mind training. And uh, four and a half years ago, they thought that the research has gotten to a point where there would be entrepreneurs to help take uh, some of these solutions to scale. What actually got me into the space is my wife. Um, I call her the wisdom in, in our family. Uh, she's a psychotherapist, uh, 25 years, um, and, uh, you know, had practiced meditation and uh, contemplative practices. Uh, so I got in this because uh, I don't actually come from a uh, an investment background. I've worked in 14 different industries in my career, but everything I do has to do with growth, uh, transformation, uh, innovation, 
and integrated leadership, and I'm really comfortable in helping to build global movements, and I think as I look out in the room and the people that are here today, that's what I, th I, th that's what I think we're building. Then I'm gonna skip over you and go to Zach, and then I'm, I'm gonna circle back. I wanna keep you all off guard by not being linear. <laughs> I love it. So okay. I shared a little bit of my yeah, there story. there we go. We've gotta liven this up a bit. So, Zach, when we were walking back after dinner last night, you said there's certain hypotheses that you have about what makes this a really interesting space. One of them was accelerated learning. Could you comment on what that means, and then are there other kind of themes that you're investing around? Sure, I shared a little bit of my background earlier, but um, Jazz Venture Partners was founded to invest in companies that are developing experiential technologies to improve human performance. These are companies that improve the human experience across a wide variety of different industries. We are targeting companies that are developing uh, digital therapeutics that will impact the current $140 billion a year neuropharmaceutical industry. We are targeting companies and looking at companies who are developing what we call validated neuro wellness applications. And these validated neuro wellness applications um, will impact the mind body wellness industry, which is over a $300 billion a year industry in the United States alone. Uh, we are also looking at um, accelerated learning startups. And these are companies that will uh, be transforming corporate learning as well as um, uh, professional services and their learning environments um, over the coming years. And then the last market segment that we're very interested um, in investing in is what we're calling experiential entertainment. And these are companies that are really developing these sort of core infrastructure technologies that are associated with venture, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, deep learning technologies, machine learning that will underpin uh, many of the companies that are developing either digital therapeutics, validated neural wellness, or accelerated learning. So I, I think Zach's making a point that there are going to be really a lot of different combinations of these technologies. And again, you mentioned earlier today there's neuroscience, huge discovery curve going on there. Uh, uh, really, the brain is a system, operating system. But then the delivery of, of experiences to people through technology, whether augmented, virtual, or smartphone, that's improving too. And we're going to see various combinations of this that then can be repurposed to solve a problem and solve a problem in different marketplaces. And a lot of what makes, I think, our jobs interesting is trying to see what that adoption curve is for those various configurations with a really good leadership team wrapped around trying to get the, the idea to scale. So, Dan, when we did our, our prep call, you, you know, speaking on behalf of of your role at Autism Speaks said, it's been, it's been hard to find investments in a way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I find that interesting because you've had so many roles and you're, you're really a scientist by mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. So is it hard because the science is in there to give you conviction in the science? Or is it more the translation of the science to be able to reach users that has given you pause? Uh, it's, a, it's a huge question. So, and, and we're the least investory sort of of everyone up here, I think. You know, we are a donor-supported nonprofit with this venture philanthropy arm that initially was intended to complement our basic research and behavioral research um, treatment or, or molecular basic um, uh, function. Um, you know, the lack of science behind things that are purported to help people with autism was a significant contributor to starting to think more seriously about what can we do to validate or push something over that threshold where it's not purely anecdotal uh, and there's actually evidence behind something. Uh, evidence meaning who this might work for, how it might affect them, uh, how long they might need to use it, when they might be able to stop, um, things like that that are missing from, say, the uh, I from iTunes or the Google I Play Store where you see a lot of apps or assistive technologies being uh, purported to positively affect quality of life for people with autism. Uh, so that's just, I'd say, on the tech end, on the life sciences end, it, it's, um, it's even a little more dire because the process of developing life science products isn't as efficient and quick. The turnaround isn't as, as rapid. Um, there's very little biopharmaceutical interest in autism. And, for, uh, for many scientific decent reasons. It's hard to determine what might be an effective outcome measure uh, to say this trial, this drug, this mechanism uh, 
uh, worked or, or didn't work as a therapeutic, um, let alone who do we target this therapeutic toward, because the autism population is incredibly diverse. There's some people with profound medical issues like GI symptoms, um, severe intellectual disability, sleep problems, epilepsy, and there's people with autism that uh, have incredible skills and advantages in some cases uh, and can function incredibly well in this world, might not need anything medical at all. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a very complex space. A, a lot of this does overlap with neuropsychiatry in general. I would argue that uh, in anxiety and depression, you're looking at uh, and addictions, uh, many different types of individuals that uh, fit within what we might uh, lump together in an autism. It's, it's at least that, uh, if not exacerbated. So, so those are some of the challenges that we saw and, and, and thought, we don't want to just fund research and end with contributing to the knowledge base um, for science and medicine. Uh, we want to see what can we, are, are there people out there that we can help that are pushing the boundaries um, of saying this could, this could help people today. And, and can we um, at least put our content area expertise behind them to help them evaluate it and get it over the top? Are you hopeful there'll be more evidence-based interventions forthcoming? And do you look at universities for that? Or where do you go look for your possibilities? Uh, in industry and academia. And honestly, it's both. I think we haven't done anything that um, it was strictly one or the other, other than, than you know, a lot of uh, sort of NIH-style uh, funding via grants from Autism Speaks. Um, I think we need that partnership. And academia is not built to commercialize products, and companies aren't necessarily built to have the infrastructure to do that long-term discovery work. Uh, and, and you know, we, we think we'll be sit in a very patient-centric place to bring these two together, uh, if not fund their work together, broker uh, their relationships, and help push things forward. So I'm, I'm optimistic that there, there's activity in both spaces, and, and we certainly see the need for both to continue to be active. So there, there's a timing in kind of the art of investing of at what stage do you invest in a company or an idea? Some of it's the temperament or the orientation of the investment firm, but some of it has to do with understanding the, uh, the necessary things that have to fall in place for that company to be successful in the, the business model or the channel of distribution that it's pursuing. So today we... Um, we heard from Adam Gazelli early this morning, seems like ages ago because of, again, how rich the day's been. Um, and Achille is uh, applying for FDA approval. And then we, uh, about an hour ago, heard from Corey McCann at Pair Therapeutics. They're going for FDA approval too. So Gary, I'm gonna ask you, for you to be comfortable as a behavioral healthcare investor what has to be in place before you would invest? Are you willing to invest pre-FDA approval? Do you want to have that step taken care of, where it's now more into the reimbursement and utilization questions? And again, every company we invest in, there's uncertainty, right? It's really knowing what uncertainty you can live with and not live with for the valuation that you can agree to invest at. So Gary, what would your response sure. be to that question? So there's really a spectrum of uh, investing uh, in new concepts and then maturing concepts to mature concepts. So you have uh, at the front end angel investors and venture capital firms that will invest in essentially ideas. Then moving up the spectrum, you have uh, growth equity and uh, I'm an operating partner uh, with Linden Capital Partners, and we, we're a middle market investor, so we invest in relatively large, mature companies. And then there's private equity firms and uh, multi-billion dollar corporations that will invest in even larger corporations. So it really depends upon where you're at in a company in terms of who you want to go to to try to raise money. So I think that in listening to the um, presentations today, I think these are more uh, early stage um, uh, companies with concepts. And I think investor, what, what investors, I think, generally are looking for is what's the value proposition? Uh, what is the um, clinical efficacy? What's the science, the evidence based behind the clinical efficacy? Uh, is it, um, how is it better? Is it safer? Is it less invasive? 
Is it greater patient compliance? Uh, how big is the, another aspect of it is, is how big is the market? Is it a very small, narrow market? Or is it a large market and is it multi-dimensional? Uh, you mentioned um, payment. So um, a, uh, depending upon your distribution, whether it's B2B, business to business, business to consumer, or business to business and business to consumer can be both, how are, you, how are people or organizations going to pay for the service? Or is it a layered on cost that they have to absorb? And are there overt costs and covert, uh, covert costs? So what are your front end expenses to get into uh, this, the service or the technology, uh, space, other issues, training, personnel that they have to um, uh, consider? Uh, and then um, uh, in the end, one of the critical aspects is the management team. And uh, I think the uh, most ideal profile of a management team is one that brings complementary expertise and experience having done something similar or partially similar to the process. So um, uh, bringing a team together with a concept with those kinds of attributes is what I, I believe would get the attention of people who want to invest. So I'd like to ask the panel, um, and, and there's a lot of activity in this space now. They're, they're just new companies creating apps every week. So is most of the investing still at the angel stage, which is great idea, few people have a vision, but don't really have revenue, are we still at that state of investing or is there a set of companies that are more mature that are now uh, post-revenue starting to earn enough money that they have net profits? Where are we in the, the maturation of this whole space? Charlie, you wanna go first? I think it's a spectrum. Uh, I think the, the most well-known company in the space, as, as we define it at Bridge Builders, would be Lumosity, which a lot of people have heard about. And they're gener generating a lot of revenue and, uh, you know, versus the, versus the rest of the field and are well known and have had a lot of capital uh, behind them. Then there are companies that I think are sort of middle stage, not very many of them, that may be doing, you know, $10 million in revenue or more. Few of those. Increasing numbers of companies that I think are doing uh, sort of a million dollars in revenue, tons of people who are coming up with increasingly similar concepts but have a passion for them and may look at things sort of a different way and those are happening, I see those happening all the time. Uh, so I think there's a wide, uh, wide spectrum, at least as I, as I experience what's happening. Any other views? Yeah, I mean, the reason we stood up Jazz Venture Partners at this point in time is because we saw an explosion of not just innovative startups, but companies that were within, you know, 18 to 36 months of actually generating significant revenue. Um, and so we're tracking over 200 different innovative startups in the space across those different market segments that I was sharing with you earlier. Uh, and it seemed like uh, the right time to be able to you know, get these teams together to be able to execute on the opportunities that were in front of them. I think one of the issues that we all face in this space of the convergence of neuroscience with digital is you know, bringing together the management teams that can effectively execute on the opportunity. I mean, if you look at Pair Therapeutics, as Corey described it, you know, he's got half of his team is digital half in San Francisco and, and half of it in Boston. Akili is the same thing. Half in Boston, half, and that's, that's a, that can be an issue in terms of generating and building a corporate culture that can execute on an effective basis on a day-by-day -day basis, and that's something you really need to take into consideration. I think, in, it, you know, quite frankly, in the case of those two companies, it hasn't gotten in the way, but I have met with management teams, you know, in other companies where they do have sort of that split, and it is creating sort of a disjuncture, and, in, and from my perspective, a complete discontinuity in their capacity to be able to execute effectively on the opportunity. So, I mean, you've, you've really got to sort of look at this space from sort of a multitude of different directions, but I think the opportunity is there. I think you can actually put a substantial amount of capital to work in the next 
12 to 24 months to really take advantage of the opportunities that you know, very innovative entrepreneurs who care passionately about bringing you know, innovative solutions to patients who are suffering um, to work. John, I'll, I'll throw in too. I think, I think being in a space where we're, we're not out for financial return on investment, that's not our primary mission, it's return on, on mission, uh, in fact. So we can take risk earlier. We're interested in, in, in being in that particular space. And what uh, I think makes us attractive now um, is organizations like, like the, the uh, neurotechnology industry organization that, that Zach uh, created is coalescing uh, companies and investors that are taking action now. So we're probably not at critical mass, but we're going there like we've never gone before. And that gave us another thought. Well, if we can push more companies through this very early stage to get some attention, there's some investors sitting on the back end that might pick this up if we can get them across some very early milestones where they're struggling to, you know, SBIR grant, things like that, get you so far, but um, there's alternative types of funding necessary to push you um, a little further in, in many cases of, of startups or entrepreneurs working alone and that these guys are here now starting, starting new investment firms, even um, being focused uh, in social impact areas uh, and looking at neurotech made it feel like the timing's right to, to look more closely to for us. I, I, I agree with you, Dan. I think the whole, um, and, and there's several of us here who are doing this more for social impact, but bringing discipline to the process mm -hmm. and a little capital now and then. Um, but I, I think th th there's a certain, this is, will be very important to the outcomes of how much this sector grows and mm -hmm. how many people are reached in the next decade. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask two questions because um, you can kind of bifurcate what's happening to there's a whole set of uh, kind of platforms that are being created that are more consumer friendly. You're going you're gonna to use it on a smartphone. And um, it's kind of like what Luminosity was, whether you agree with their ability to produce sustainable results, which is called the transfer effect from being skilled at the game to having your brain actually change. But Luminosity was kind of a platform to stay sharp. Do you all think we'll have companies that get to be as big as Luminosity that are more designed to make us for our well-being, for our mental well-being? No our question, social well -being? much bigger, Absolutely. Okay. much bigger. That's, just, that's yeah. a strong yes, ladies yeah, and, and gentlemen. They're, they're already in yeah. development. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Can uh, you mention names? In yeah, this? so there's a, I mean, there's a British company called Peak, and they are working, you know, they're a purely mobile-based application for brain fitness, and they were started by a group of ex-Google engineers who are experts in game mechanics and developing applications, you know, gaming apps. I mean, they went at it from that perspective of how do we create virality first and then bring in the science to be able to improve one's you know, uh, fitness. And so uh, they, they have teamed up with, you know, well-known neuroscientists to bring sort of new applications to market, but they went first into how do you design and get viral fast. Um, I think that they have a bright future. I, I would also say there is, a, there is a difference between making a claim around treatment of a disease versus being a consumer product which is aimed at people who don't have a disease. And those are quite different. Um, and one thing uh, I, I would personally argue is if you actually have a product with rigorous clinical data that's FDA approved, that's going to be prescribed by a doctor, the ultimate market potential of that type of product will actually exceed uh, a consumer play, right? If you think about a drug versus a food supplement. And it really comes down to are you making a claim about a disease? So, I mean, what we all have in common is, you know, we're consumers and we're also patients. So the next time you walked into uh, to see your doctor, imagine if the doctor said, oh, you know, for your ailment, I, I just found out about this really cool product. There's absolutely no evidence that it works. It's not FDA approved and I'm going to prescribe it to you. <laughs> How would you feel? Probably not so good about that. But why would we feel any differently if that intervention is a digital one? if that intervention is making a disease claim? And why would a doctor actually recommend a product unless there's real evidence behind it? And I think for the industry to really mature, it has to start to move more into that mainstream medical space, which it will start to do, but that's really gonna require evidence-based trials. So to that point, 
I, most of my experience in investing is on the services side. And much of the capital and behavioral health is going towards uh, more inpatient oriented and uh, residential oriented treatment facilities. So the industry is very much still, hard to believe, but still very much inpatient centric. And what, um, uh, if you look at the spectrum of providers, we're a distribution um, center, we're district national or international global distribution centers for these technologies. And I think if, uh, to your point, if you bring those kinds of technologies and applications to providers and there's really proof of concept and good evidence-based science and you know, it's affordable, then I think you're going to find markets, business markets and consumer markets uh, to uh, bring your, ser your technologies and applications to them, to the users. I would just add a little insider's baseball that the role some of us play because we're on boards of these companies and they have an idea and they have a intervention that is promising. And a lot of what we do as board members is really have this discourse on what is your claim, what can be substantiated, what evidence do you need to be a good fiduciary to the public and what's your pathway based on how you make these choices? And it, it does vary. I think ultimately it's going to be very, I, I think there's, because of the neurological mechanisms, the agents of change that happen in the brain is not that different for a peak performance claim than a hmm. FDA claim, right? It's kind of operating at some level the same way. So. Uh, but I will also say that if you go for FDA approval, it requires capital and time, right? Which does not come easily to startups, so. Right, but to Eric's point, the market opportunity is so large for a digital therapeutic that a physician can then prescribe yeah. for ADHD, for pain, for mm -hmm. schizophrenia, you name it, um, that that is the opportunity that we need to be, you know, putting our arrows behind to get validity into the space itself. Mm -hmm. And then you can do the consumer versions, sort of as yeah, you can do that follow-ons. It's like what, what leads and what follows right. as a strategy, really. Um, so would anybody like to speculate in a decade, if you go to your mental health provider or you have a condition, what will be the treatment range from digital health versus traditional small molecule? How, how quickly will these new interventions be become mainstream uh, treatment protocols that physicians or mental health professionals will use? Or five years, 10 years, 20 years? Anybody want to wage an opinion? And what, and what will slow it up and what will accelerate it? I'd, I'd throw out there five to 10 before at least there's a couple things that become more regular among maybe more accepting therapists. Um, and if, if nothing else, that it's not so much pure biopharma companies that are, or biotech or pharmaceutical companies that are driving novel healthcare, it is now. Google, Apple, IBM, uh, Samsung, um, and Microsoft. Uh, and if, you know, some of those companies are spinning out life sciences, um, small companies like Calico out of Google, uh, but that they're behind in a huge way with dollars and other types of resources, finding how technologies impact health. Uh, there's just nothing, we've never seen anything like this before, outside of maybe a golden age, um, following the successful marketing of Prozac in neuroscience and you know, but similar drugs uh, following that and across the 90s. Uh, this is sort of this, maybe a second resurgence in neuro and it's, you know, it's the uh, infiltration of tech. I think that's changing everything. Not sure this is on, there we go. Um, in a recent discussion about uh, this particular area of, of digital health, but more broadly, not mental health, digital health broadly, someone said that there are really only two factors you have to master, value and trust. Mm. And it seems to me in this area, we're still talking about value. I'd love to get the panel to talk about the trust piece because mm. on the digital neuroscience, digital me mental health part of this, 
it feels like that's a much bigger challenge than it is for diabetes or cancer or other digital health areas. Could, you, could we get some sense of what the risks are there and is this an area which actually could go off track if uh, in the same way that there's been so much blowback around bad behavior by pharma towards small molecules, we could see people dismiss this whole opportunity because of wild claims being made or uh, the violation of personal privacy or a whole bunch of issues that could blow up the trust question. Such a great question, and I, I think you actually hit the two big issues that could blow this whole area up. So one is, um, if there's a sense by potential patients or consumers of an exaggeration of claims, and you know that it could potentially be a real problem, but I think the way to tackle that is really by having companies um, and by having academics who are willing to engage in real clinical trials, and who aren't going to be afraid to say, you know what, we're going to go where the science takes us, and let's really run the types of trials that one would run for any other type of therapeutic to really prove it out. Now, if you see uh, products making wildly exaggerated claims, you know, we, we do have to be a little bit careful, right? We don't want to end up kind of where the food supplement industry is, where there you know, might be, and by the way, you know, I know uh, a number of people have had really good personal experiences with food supplements, and I don't want to completely put that down, but I guess that's perhaps an example where there might be more generally some distrust because certain groups have made more exaggerated claims. And the other is exactly what you said, which is safeguarding patient privacy is going to be very key. Um, and really the sense that data is being used in a responsible manner, so as these products are being used, you know, all of us, when we download an app, right, there's all this stuff that comes up, you know, do you accept this, do you accept that, and of course, how many people read that? I mean, I'm in the industry and I don't, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be a willingness by companies to really treat data in the correct way, uh, and in a way that if the data is going to be used for, uh, in any way that might be of concern to a patient, to inform the user, consumer, patient, whoever it is, hey, this is how we're going to be, use your data, and, and that's going to be critical. But yeah, I think that data piece is really important. There are companies now that are starting to track our heart rates, uh, our brain waves. Interaxon is a company we're an investor in, and uh, Graham Moffat is here, and they're really concerned that the whole industry around EEG develops in a way where people's brand, brain data is not shared. And you combine all of the different ways that you can start to track human behavior. It's not just like, what pills am I taking? It is all about what my what were my emotions last week? What happened during that time that created that emotion? Here's what my brainwave was. So if there is not, uh, you know, if the, if the boards of those companies and the employees are not thinking about that trust up front, they are not going to be able to build a business because it is very sensitive data. Other opinions or thoughts on this question? Well, I think at the core, Tom, of, of the issue of trust is is ultimately validation. Is the technology solid? Is there reliable science behind it? And if there's reliable science and, and the science can be validated effectively, then the trust will come from that. Um, and, and so I think the companies really need to focus on, on that issue, and the boards of the companies really need to focus on that. And, and that will carry, those will be the long-term durable businesses that survive. It won't be the company that comes out and says, hey, we can improve your cognitive clarity by you know, 30%, and maybe the FTC comes after them and says, what do you mean by cognitive clarity? And what are your controls? Um, it will be the companies that go through the clinical trials that actually have you know, the efficacious outcomes that we're all seeking for these indications. So, so since this is about investors, I guess, you know, I guess the question on the table is, do you have the patience for that? Because that takes time, right? That's, that's a several year process. <laughs> And yet, you're looking at companies that want to have quarterly earnings and something that you can see in the near term. So how do you balance those two things? Because one of the things that should make all of you nervous is the opportunity, is the possibility this whole area blows up because of claims made that can't be substantiated, that make everybody very cynical about what you can do with digital tools to improve brain health. Well, I think the key there is that we need to develop an investor community in this area that can do multi-round um, syndicates 
um, successfully together. And so even on this panel, we've got Charlie who does very early stage Autism Speaks, who, Dan here who does very early stage seed investing. We're focused on Series A. Eric uh, with PureTech can do sort of very early stage but takes it much further than most seed stage groups. Um, and we'll, we'll be involved in Series Bs as well. And then you've got um, Gary here who's you know, willing to take it sort of that next step. And I can tell you within the investor community in Silicon Valley that we're speaking with right now, they're all interested in this space. They just don't have the internal expertise to be able to understand whether or not these are viable companies or not. So you really do need within the investment teams themselves the capacity and understanding of you know, what's relevant neuroscience <laughs> and what is relevant and interesting digital technology. So you really do need these sort of bespoke teams to be brought together to be able to understand the investment opportunities. And then the Andreessen's and the more David Dow's and the NEA's will come and plow in in the Series B's and Series C's filling out those 30 to $50 million rounds should they be required. Right. Let me add a couple of uh, thoughts to the group. Uh, in my, the last company that I started, uh, my, our Series A investors, uh, the lead investors were MD, MBAs. So they understood the science and they understood the business. And that was particularly helpful uh, as uh, a manager uh, because I think that they had a realistic expectation of what our growth engine was going to be. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, I think um, being able to communicate to your investors uh, and being conservative in your time frames, I think is very important. The other thing is, is I think it's better to have more than one investor is to have uh, several uh, two or three investors so that if one, if something happens to one of your investor groups, you're not uh, out on the street um, having to try to find cash to fund your operation. You still have others that are there to help you. If, if I would, I, oh, sorry, go on. I also say on the, on, the, on the trust piece, I would hope that um, that increasing engagement of, of foundations that are patient advocacy, if not research and advocacy, or organizations like PCORI being involved, and involving the community very, very early on in a concept before it's even in seed, maybe. You're talking about the, talking to the founding scientists, the founding technology developers, um, and, and starting, so you know, in our case, in some cases, we're talking to these guys, and they've only put it in uh, a couple kids with, with autism, or families they know with, that have autism in their families, in their neighborhood, and we're already starting to get some real feedback. And uh, yeah, that maybe that's barely over anecdotal, but that's where it begins. And the more you involve the community at that early stage in this network of investors that could carry it all the way through, I, I think, hopefully, the more trust you'd have on the, on the back end if, they've, uh, if, if patients or people with a condition have been involved um, from the beginning, your, your target population. I, I would hope that that's one way to address it. Otherwise, that is certainly a sticky, uh, tough spot. Can I add another element to this, just mm -hmm. to address sort of the whole, the whole question of digital therapeutics uh, and you know the need for them? We, uh, you know, as we look at things, we look at uh, 60 to 70, and I don't know exactly what the number is. I've heard it up to 75 percent of doctor visits are related to stress, and part of what we're trying to do is to uh, provide interventions so that people will never have to go to the doctor and will never have to ask these questions because people will take responsibility for their health care. People will maybe meditate 10 days, you know, 10 minutes a day, find other solutions through other maybe contemplative practices, through other maybe, you know, a, a platform about positive psychology so that they won't, they won't have to go in and use these things on the back end and it will be a lot less expensive for our healthcare system. So one of, that's one of the things that drives the kind of investments that we're looking for. Yeah, Tom, I'll add probably the final comment on this and we'll open for questions. In the practice of therapy, there is professional conduct. And I think it would be interesting to see what standards of conduct do we expect digital uh, providers to hold themselves to that are commiserate with what the professions have done and how would that then be you know built into the algorithms and the um, the business standards of those organizations to build long term because you can't without long term trust people will not use the interventions 
that and this will fail. So it, it needs to be a fundamental part of the value set of, of these startups and it needs to be reinforced by investors and, and even the customer should ask for it. And I think it, it forces a bigger issue around privacy that we need to have as a society. So uh, with that, let's open for questions over here. Hi, John. Um, uh, there are two addictions that jump out at me that are beyond the mental health field that are sweeping the country. One is Facebook, mm -hmm. the other is smartphones. They're incredibly addictive and they violate all sorts of trust and yet they deliver tremendous value to the end user. So try to expand beyond that little uh, concubine called mental health and think about how there are addictions, whether we call them positive or negative, that are truly changing the way that we communicate and that we serve each other in our society. Thank you. I, I can actually talk, you know, we have one company here that we're investors in, Claritas Mind Sciences, which is based on Dr. Judson Brewer's uh, work, Phil McCauley's right there. And what, what Judson's really shown is that, techno is that addictions, whether it be to cigarettes or opiates or even down to what you're addressing, the, the habit loop is, is very similar. So some of these solutions actually, you know, may be able to address those uh, addictions uh, over a period of time. Next question. Um, so I, but my question is, I'm, you, most of your panelists are investors in the tech, these te new technologies, but Gary, I don't know how much you've talked about your background, is, is, has a lot of experience investing in behavioral health services. Um, and so, and you know, the behavioral health services side, the acute inpatient uh, psych, acute inpatient residential substance abuse, and the intermediate levels of care is a, is a very um, profitable business in the last four or five years, and there's been a tremendous amount a private equity investment in that. So, but most of those places are delivering somewhat old treatments, should we say, to be kind. So, um, is there some marriage here between the investors in the services, behavioral health services companies and entities in these new technologies? And would you all kind of have some feedback about that? So, um, Henry, thanks for the question. I think that's a really good question. I, I think, uh, to answer uh, one of the earlier questions, I think that the behavioral health space is a very hot space from an investment uh, standpoint for a wide variety of reasons. Parity uh, because of what's happening nationally uh, on a bunch of uh, related issues. So there's a lot of capital that I think is interested uh, and I think that um, uh, the imp because it's very much inpatient centric, I think it's very ripe for disruption for uh, therapeutic interventions that um, can demonstrate, as we have said earlier, clinical efficacy, lower cost, and the other attributes that make for a concrete evidence-based value proposition and that can be distributed into the uh, practitioners or directly into the consumers. So um, I think there's tremendous opportunity and I think that um, uh, early, uh, where there are applications and uh, opportunities, I think that service providers will be early, uh, some service providers will be early adapters and I think they will create a strategic advantage for themselves in the marketplace. Hi, my name is Jeff Richardson. I operate a community behavioral health organization. Uh, and contrary to what Henry was saying, we're the low profit piece of behavioral health. We provide uh, residential programs, in-home services, community behavioral health and addictions programs. Uh, we serve about 25,000 people on an ongoing basis. Now, my question becomes one that we have been an early adopter with some applications. You heard actually Big White Wall was one of the applications that we're using. My struggle, and I'd love to hear from an investment perspective, we have a significant need. People have had enormous value from this product and a wide distribution channel for, for these applications. Um, what's being done to help with access 
to this technology? Um, are you working with any carriers around uh, um, anything from access to broader access for Wi-Fi, free devices to, to deliver these, these applications on? I think this is a huge gap and a huge opportunity if you guys can come together and solve this. Well, there's some head shaking on the panel. Uh, just to the, to the last point about getting technology into the hands of, let's say, behavioral interventionists um, in neurodevelopmental conditions like autism, um, we, we do, we have a, you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's an iPad giveaway program that is probably one of our most popular and sought after and applied for um, awards that we do over grants for hundreds of thousands of dollars for research. Uh, we, we received thousands of applications and we, we gave away about 1,500 last year and over the past couple of years and just looking for ways to expand that because um, even in this very specific case, tablet-based tools have transformed some aspects of intervention like it has in, in education. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a drop in the bucket, but I mean the, the uh, hunger for it is amazing. The hunger and the demand is there. Yeah, it is, it is. I think that um, payers and providers that are rewarded on the basis of being able to improve clinical outcomes, manage or reduce costs, and improve patient and stakeholder satisfaction will look at uh, acquiring and supporting new technologies independent of the historical reimbursement systems on a test basis. And if it works, then I think there'll be broader application across markets. I think this is so uh, enlightening as to its possible future, and I think that Tom Insull put his, uh, put the thumb on it as to say, how do you ensure trust and quality going future? And I've seen this happen in the omega-3 and the fisheries world, and um, how, how unscrupulous and small companies um, nearly blew things apart and how the industry responded by policing itself rather than having the reporters and the media police it. And um, I wonder uh, how you could potentially set up an industry, an external industry group to make industry-wide criteria of efficacy, um, of value, and, and of trust, and whether that's something you, I, 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 I think it's a big challenge, because you are over a domain of not only treating illnesses, but um, improving optimal health. So how, do you think it's possible to um, create a structure to police yourself, and by what criteria? There's, there's always the opportunity to do that. Um, the, the problem that you face is the bad actors. The bad actors aren't going to participate, and they're going to drive their own agenda forward with the marketing dollars that they have to be able to do that. So we but then you have, you have somebody to bust them. Yes, right. So I, th I think that that's a real opportunity mm -hmm. that the companies in this space could actually come around you know, and participate in as sort of a roundtable working group to be able to you know, dictate or, shall we say, articulate um, some standards right, that companies should follow in that process. And in fact, um, some of the EEG companies are coming together you know, in just this way to figure out how they might protect, you know, brain data um, and trying to get ahead of the curve and from a public relations perspective as well as from an industry perspective around a, a problem that's just bound to happen. The EEG data from some companies is just going to get hacked and it's going to get out there and it's going to cause an uproar. And so these companies are coming together right now like Interaxon and trying to lead that effort prior to that happening. So it's an excellent suggestion. I, I, th I think, and, and you know, it's early days maybe, but there's, um, honestly, not to, uh, from an uneducated uh, perspective, uh, Cyber Guide right outside that door is attempting to produce an online uh, reviewer assessment uh, where you get real user responses um, within specific indication areas on specific app tools. And it's, it's not FDA, for example, but um, that's, you know, maybe one place where there's ideas coming from the nonprofit space to help guide consumers as to what might be legitimately therapeutic versus uh, what is completely based on anecdotal stuff. And then with, uh, with Achille and, and Evo, 
um, and, and Adam Ghazali and, and other researchers in the neurogaming space coming out with a sort of a, a, a commentary white paper together joining forces on what might be legitimate in the neurogaming space in terms of providing real cognitive improvement versus uh, something non-sustainable that's a game you play and it doesn't have functional improvement really. Um, but you know, maybe those are two early pieces. I mean, this comprehensive solution. Is there an FDA of all this? Um, maybe it's 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 growing as as Evo and others push through there. Um, we don't want to have to rely on the FDA. Uh, in in omega threes and fish, having a sticker, you know, that said this this industry group approves this product. Well, maybe they've learned from. Them. Hopefully, and, and we, uh, maybe the evolution is better, but you're right, probably. Yeah, and we, we may need a clearinghouse that can certify the good housekeeping seal of approval. Right? I mean, that really is what CyberGuide is yeah, attempting to yeah. do, so. Right. Linda, you get the last question. Great. So I want to ask a question that's been on my mind a lot as I've thought about this issue over the last year, learning about the tremendous promise that, of the work that's going on in this sphere, um, and at the same time, I think the unease amongst many people, um, we wouldn't blink about a pacemaker if our heart was about to go, but when Dr. Sanchez gave his excellent presentation and he talked about invasive um, technologies, I could see and feel the feeling in the room and there is an unease about that and I think it relates to the question of as we use technology differently, as we become more intertwined with our technology, how do we at the same time keep the imperfect randomness and creativity that makes us human? And I, and I certainly think from talking with folks who don't wander this sphere, that's a question that relates to the trust question that came up earlier. And I wonder if any of you have any thoughts that, or comments you'd like to make about that issue. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, we couldn't have said it any better than you. <laughs> if, if it's I, just something that I hear a lot as I'm talking with people who don't wander in this world. So, at least at Bridge Builders, what, if, I, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, we're actually trying to look at uh, companies that provide so, solutions or opportunities for people to connect more deeply to themselves so they can fully live more to who they actually are to express their creativity, to express their productivity, uh, more so than they did before the intervention. So uh, I don't know if that responds to your question, but that's of real interest to us. Well, and I guess another way of, que of asking it is, and here's a, here's a concrete example. Look at my 20-something year old kids. They don't know how to read a map and when their cell phone dies, they don't know how to get places. <laughs> As we use our technology to do things that before our brains did intuitively, are our brains changing in other ways? And as, and as um, neuroscientists, as we're looking at the way things are evolving, how is that question considered? Yeah, well, Linda, that's your next conference. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. okay we'll do yeah. it again. <laughs> All right, so I want to thank the panel, and I'd like to thank you for your undivided attention. Good afternoon.